if you start taking that mindset and that approach to life, that attack the hill mindset, you are going to be more dominant in everything you do with your family, your fitness, your finance, and your faith. Hey, welcome to another episode of The Empire Show. I'm Bedros Koulian, and this is an inside look. And today we've got two very special people to me. They are not only dear friends, they are also business partners of mine. Uh, we've got former Navy SEAL Ray Cash Care, and we've got U.S. Marine Steve Eckhart. Um, and we are about to do a deep dive into what's happening here with COVID-19 crisis. We're going to talk about the project and how uh, the state of men and the state of mind of men and, of course, leadership and uh, some fun stories that you guys haven't shared before and hopefully we'll get to share here. So, mm. gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having us. All right. Um, so, Steve, let's start with you. You uh, how long how long ago were you a Marine and how did you get into the Marine Corps? What made you go down the Marine Corps? How long ago? Still am. Oh, right. That's right. Can you explain that? Because the first time I asked that question, you snapped at me. Can you explain to our audience why you still are? Well, it sounds like navies could be former Navy SEALs. There's no such thing as a former Marine. Once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. And that's what they expect us to live according to the code and the values your entire life. Now, you said, how did I get into the Marine Corps? Because I wasn't exactly living according to those codes and values before the Marine Corps. Mm. Mm. What, uh, so now I've got to ask you to expand on that. How did that unfold? Well, the Marine Corps gives you, a, you have to do a, a minimum of an eight-year contract, four years active and four years reserve, inactive reserve. So it's an eight-year commitment you have to make. So it was either that eight-year commitment or three to four-year commitment somewhere else. So I chose the eight-year commitment. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you uh, made the right commitment to the Marine Corps. And Ray, you know, I don't think a lot of people know, you know, they see you on my social media, they see both of you on my social media, but I don't think they know how you got into the Marine Corps, or I'm sorry, into oh, the- He into couldn't the, get into the Marine Corps. <laughs> they have height standards. Right. Into Here's the SEAL one. program. Uh, and, and guys, if, if you, I gotta tell you, I wish I could wear a helmet cam during the 75 hours of the project <laughs> and broadcasted live because the- No, there would be no more project after the first class. If that but the, the hijinks case. between the two of you uh, behind the scenes would be fascinating. The, the world would just be hooked on that show. Um, th these two really do ham it up and it's like 75 hours of great entertainment for me as we change lives of men. But you, you decided that you're going to become a Navy SEAL. Was that like a life goal or did you hear about it? How do you become a Navy SEAL? Well, you know, uh, I was told I was a piece of shit my whole life. And from all the way from my mother to my friends, just you're never going to amount to nothing and, you know, boo-hoo, poor me. And I went into the recruiters because I was getting in a lot of trouble. And it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't judge ordered, but if I didn't make that change, right, we talk about, you know, pivoting my life, um, I was going to be going down the wrong path, went into the recruiters. Uh, it's funny, I actually originally went into, I took my ASVAB test. Bombed it, just horrible. What is the ASVAB? ASVAB is an aptitude test you take where it gives you like placement and what you can do in the military. And I didn't place real high. Um, so mm. it was like barber or medic. That, that was my two, my two things. And I was like, wow, medic to save lives or I could like cut hair. Okay. Mm. Um, Went in and I so, saw. Wow, so barber and medic have the that same was it. skill sets. Yes, yeah. I know. I know. You're good with a scalpel. My, you're good with a yeah. scalpel. I wouldn't want my barber to I do know. any kind of medical stuff. I on know. Me. But I, when I went in there, I was talking. I saw this pamphlet on the Navy SEALs. I'm sorry, Steve. And it just looked like this amazing thing. These guys were like bigger than life, and it was like it's the hardest thing to do in the world. And I can't describe it, but I was like. From that up to that moment, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. You know, I was just kind of like this aggressive kid that was really good at stuff, but I was always looking for more. And I was like, that's it. And that's what I wanted to do. And then I mm -hmm. said, hey, even the recruiter, the per fucking recruiter, pardon my language, said, I don't know if this is for you. And I'm like, oh, this is for me. And it took me a while to get there, but I did it. So, uh, yeah. it, you know, it, the, the journey, it made it worth the while. Well, so you fast forward, I don't know how many years now mm -hmm. for each of us and you know, I don't know, probably for like a, at least a decade plus for, for all of us. And then we kind of stumble upon each other. Steve and I met when, because Steve, you're also a gym owner out in New York, even though you live in California, you run your gyms uh, in New York remotely. Uh, you were in my seven-figure formula mastermind for how many years? In there for about 
two, two to three years. Two to three years. And then just the other programs before that and online stuff before that. Yeah. So several years even before the actual mastermind. Yeah. And then through the mastermind, we met, connected, and um, out of the blue, this guy goes, um, hey, I think I want to move to California. And so I want the next 12 months of my coaching to be on how I'm going to move to California and run my gyms in New York. And I was like, well, why do you want to move to California? He's like, well, it's the sun, the palm trees, and if I can run my business and from California, why not? And so right around that time, I'd written my book, Man Up, and it was coming out. And as the book came out, there was a lot of people buying it. And I talked about these six-week challenges that I would do. And I really pushed myself and during the six-week period and see what I was made of. And it would build mental toughness, emotional resilience, and kind of really take me mentally, physically, emotionally to a new level. And people would reach out to me and be like, hey, you ought to consider doing these challenges for more men who mm. need to level up. And I was like, well, man, if I did it, I would need someone like, like Steve, who's just like this, this programming machine where fitness is concerned. But I would also need, you know, like a, if a perfect world, I'd need a Navy SEAL. And then I would need someone who could teach combatives. And, and in my head, but, but every time someone would send me messages, I would just kind of, yeah, just go do the challenge on your own. Go figure it out. I punished myself for six weeks. Go, go do it on your own. But it was a reoccurring theme. And when you moved out to California, I remember asking you, like, hey, if something like this was to happen, would you be a part of it? You're like, yeah. Well, that December, mm -hmm. I meet you. Yeah. In Florida. And we're both speaking at a, in Miami, I think. Yeah, we were, we're in both Miami. both speaking sorry. at an event. And um, I think... We did a mic check because we're speaking the, the next day, and then you're like, hey, let's go to the bar. Yeah. Yeah. And you introduced me to the stuntman. Stunt what, what is a stuntman? Well, the stuntman is, it's, I was always told it's a Navy, old Navy tradition. It's where, you know, obviously you take the basic ingredients of tequila, the, the salt, the lemon, and the tequila. But you snort the salt, drink the uh, tequila, and then rub the lemon in your eye. And I think after a few of those, we just kind of, wow. things escalated quickly when we Sounds met. Sounds very normal. Very yeah, normal. very normal. <laughs> yeah. But um, okay. yeah. we, we really hit it off. You know, we had a lot yeah. in common. We were talking. and yeah, A lot in common. You're both puking out of your eyeball and sn snorting snots <laughs> yeah. out. I do have to say, I don't think the first, did, did I do it with you there? Or did I do it the next time we came, we hung out, which was in Southern California at, at the sushi joint? I think I did a couple in front of you. Yeah. And you were like, what the? Yeah, I was like, this But then afterwards, when we came, when I came You thought out, there was a roofie in there, so you said, no, you, you just like, show me how it's yeah, done. Yeah, okay, I get it. This is legit. So I think yeah. you, you probably looked it up and did some research. Yeah, and, and, and I got to say, uh, it, yeah, it was one of those things where, again, we hit it off quick, uh, just like with Steve. And then, interestingly enough, it's like, all right, so I've got the guy who can program. I've got the guy who can kind of really, really teach like, and structure this thing and by the way, Aaron and I were working out, and he goes, hey, how cool would it be if we can create something for men where they don't just have to have superficial conversation? Mm -hmm. Hey, what's, what sports team do you like? How's the weather? What are you into? Like, men could really go deep and, and you know, develop a brotherhood and stuff. And he's like, how cool would it be if it was some kind of a project like that? I was like, yeah, some kind of a project like that would be awesome. And people ask me, like, what do you call it the project? It's like, well, Aaron and I just kept referring to it while we were working out as a project. Mm -hmm. And I'd never even, even though he's the VP of our supplement company, I didn't know that he had a history of MMA and jujitsu and all that. And as we talk about that, I'm like, all right, so now I've got the Marine who's a programming, like just brilliant programmer for where, where fitness is concerned. I've got the SEAL who can create this entire 75 hour experience. I've got someone who can teach combatives. And then of course, Schneider, who's upstairs now in Southern California, he was a dude that I met in Idaho and he ran a kill house, which uh, maybe one of you can explain what a kill house or a shoot house is to our audience. Since yeah, you guys have a military background. A kill house is you know close quarter combat, close quarters uh, defense, CQC, CQD. Um, kind of the reference is when you go into a room uh, of the unknown. You know SWAT do it, military forces of all all natures do it, and you want to create. It's called violence of action. Uh, the element of surprise. You want to go in and establish dominance and you know take control of the room, utilizing angles and corners to your uh, to your advantage but while working as a team. And you can do it both audible and non-audible. So it's a lot of communication and teamwork just all bunched into one. It's an amazing, amazing thing, especially when you start doing what's called dynamic room entries where you're using breaching charges and, and you know, you can let the dog in. It's, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it always ends up working out great for us because, you know, we're, we're very 
everybody from the SWATs to everything that we do, we have, we're so educated on it that, uh, like I said, what you add that violence of action, um, you know, don't bet against us because we're, we're never going to lose. Yeah. And yeah. So to that point, our friend Matt was, um, he was a cop in Boise, Idaho, and then became a SWAT officer and then stopped doing that and opened up his own kill house or shoot house. And a, f a mutual friend of ours said, hey, why don't you take Andrew up there and have a good time? And, you know, he'll take you through a shoot house experience with pellet guns, obviously, not with real guns. And uh, we did. Well, a few months later, I sent him my book in the mail. When the book came out, he reads the book. He texts me. He goes, hey, what's it going to take for us to work together? And I was like, hey, Matt, I don't know anything about shoot houses or what you do with SWAT, so I don't think I can help. I, I thought he was asking, like, could I start a shoot house franchise or something? I go, I don't know anything about any of that, man, but, you know, have a good life. And he goes, no, 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 I want to come out there and work with you, work for you. I was like, holy shit, let's get on the phone. And so now I've got, like, the entire instructor cadre. And um, without a website, without anything, we launched the project. And it's one hell of an experience. And Steve, you've done such a good job of explaining to the project candidates as they're going through it, what it is and what it's going to produce for them. Like when someone asks you on the street, hey, what is the project? What do you tell them? I tell them basically it's a personal development program for men, it's a 75 hour or four day personal development program for men where they get the chance to learn, live and train with a United States Marine, a Navy SEAL, a SWAT officer, an MMA expert, an empire builder where we're pouring literally decades and decades of knowledge into you so that you can level up and become a better husband, father, entrepreneur, business owner, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And it's an experience in just a few days that you're getting so much knowledge and growth, it's equivalent to years and years of training. We're literally pouring into them every second. It's a force multiplier in their life. Now, not everyone that goes through the project though, I mean, just the way you described it, it sounds really lovely and awesome. And every guy's probably like, well, shoot, I'd love that to get Disneyland. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of knowledge and wisdom from experts in their, what do you call it, subject matter experts? So, shmees, yes. Yeah, right? In their in their areas in 75 hours, I'll take it. But the you old. personally have made people quit. Oh, that's my job. That's what I if, if I have one God given gift, it's to make people quit itself. I don't know why that is, but that's what he's given me. Because that's my job there, is to put them on that block and draw that line in the sand. You're either gonna be with us or you're going home, one or the other. We need you to, we need to test them and challenge them that way, right? To make sure they have what it takes. We, yeah. we don't want someone to be able to wear that logo that's not capable of being a modern day knight like we, like we talk about. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to completely break them down. Now in Marine Corps boot camp, we have 14, 13, 14 weeks to break them down. 75 hours, we need to accelerate that. And so to that point, the Quitting process is modeled after the BUDS program that SEALs go through. Yes. And BUDS is what? Basic Underwater Demolition. Basic Underwater Demolition. It's a six-month course that's that's broken down into what's called PTR, which is a kind of an introductory phase, and then you have first, second, and third phase, which is first phase. The, the milestone is Hell Week, where you stay awake for five days. You average about 30 minutes of sleep in five days. Second phase, you have what's called Pool Comp, where they literally... Um, you have to go through procedures, SOP, standard operating procedures, to don and uh, undon like your, your gear underwater. So pretty much it's like you're wrestling alligators and crocodiles to survive. And then third phase is obviously the demolition, um, where you have to do like time fuse calc and you have to work with explosives. And we, that's where we hone in all of our, our skill sets with patrolling and our tactics out of San Clemente Island. So that's, that's roughly about six months just to get through that to have the honor to say that you graduated buds, yes. And and so when when I asked you to really build out mm -hmm. the process, um, and we'll go through the three phases of the project in of just a moment, how those break down. Um, you know, you, you you brought in this beautiful brass bell. Yes. That, you know, the first thing you said to me was like, do not ever ring it. And That's so right. even when we carry it around. Um, BK Strength, because for that 75 hours, BK Strength, my private gym uh, and garage in the back turns into the project compound. Exactly. Um, what, what's the significance of when, when Bud's candidates ring the bell? Like, wh is it voluntarily? Are they told to go ring a bell? How does it, this it, work? It's voluntary. So Bud's basic underwater demolition is a, a volunteer, you know, you volunteer to go to it, but obviously you have to meet requirements and get the checks in the boxes to make it. Uh, the same, we use the same applications. We apply pressure. 
physical, mental, emotional pain. We, we deprive you of everything. Food, you, you know as well as I do. Sleep. Um, we take everything away from these men so that we can break them down to the bare minimum. So like when we do, a, a, it's something called steel pier where we're out there just in our like little silkies freezing at night. Like that's just us. I mean, we're freezing. We're sticking to the steel. Literally, you have to go somewhere that you've never gone before. And that's why we still have attrition rated. What, I think it's almost 50%. 50%. of people who aren't willing to take that, that leap of faith and believe in themselves. And the biggest question I always have afterwards is I ask somebody, if you wanted it so much, if you were willing to... Let's, let's just forget about the money that you have to spend to come here, but you're willing to give up three days of your life, four days of your life. Why are you so, so easily influenced to just quit? I mean, we've just told you, I watched you just said, hey, just quit. And they quit. I, I don't understand. And that's why I think this program is, man, it should be mandatory for every male on the planet because you should not be influenced. You should be the influencer and it should mm. be of positivity. And that's what I'm noticing. And before I go on, why this program is so unique compared to everything else out there. You know, this isn't a Spartan race. Um, this isn't a SEAL fit. This is you have to go through check checkoffs of pain and emotional discipline. And just you have to bring up a lot of skeletons just to graduate. And then once you graduate, what's so unique about this course versus any other course is that's when the work really starts, just like in BUDS. Once you graduate BUDS you're not a SEAL, then you have to do other things. And what you're constantly doing and how, you know, that's, we sat down and talked about this is, you know, we have weekly check-ins. You have to constantly hone in those skills, right? Being the best version of you is a perishable skill. And if you don't apply it, mm. you know, every day of the week, then, you know, like we talked about the samurai sword, just because you sharpen the sword and hang it up on the wall, it doesn't mean it's gonna be sharp. You have to sharpen it every day. And that's what's so unique about what we do because we have, you know, we have getaways where we, we gather and we get together and we break bread and we, we have dive buddies. You know, I have, mm -hmm. I have a dive buddy that I rely on. And this is a lifetime brotherhood. This isn't something, I mean, we all have the same exact tattoo right here. Everything is based off a of tradition and you have to earn that tradition otherwise we will have a review board, which we've, we've talked about with some individuals. And even though they graduate, just like in the SEAL teams, if you're not maintaining that level of excellence, and I don't want you to maintain it and, you know, working for you, you can't just, you have to exceed it, then you're going to get cut. And that's why I believe in this so much, because we are making the best version of people, that, men, that they can be. So let's talk about that, because I, I think I have probably one of the I have one of the funnest roles during the 75 hours because I naturally am a bit of a papa bear. Mm -hmm. I want to take it's care disgusting. of disgusting. It's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it's and I disgusting. know that makes Steve sick to his stomach. It's, I love okay. when you come in and pisses him off. I love it. I, I'm the papa bear. And, and Steve, you, you truly do have a gift of getting people to quit. But really, they're the ones making the decision. Not to get them to quit. I want to make sure it's not... The goal right. isn't to make them to quit. The goal is to make sure the ones that get through earn the right, as Ray just said. And yeah. then they have to earn that title every single day of being a modern-day knight. We need to make them earn that title. We need to break them down so we can build them back up. If they're not willing and ready to, then yes, we will make, we will make them quit. So let's talk about that for a moment. You've, especially you, you're around like pretty much the entire 75 hours. The rest of us will sometimes take a little sleeping break, a couple hours here and there. You, you're a beast. Weakness. <laughs> Weakness. <laughs> Papa Bear has to go in the cave and... <laughs> some honey. I've got to comb my hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say seals have pretty hair, so you got to maintain the looks. Why, when people quit, uh, and I've seen a dude quit when he was just army crawling. Mm. He was a strength and conditioning coach, paid 12 grand to be there. I'm guessing, I mean, I know I would, if, if I was going to go do the project, I would tell everybody like, man, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to come back a new man, a new father, a new husband. I'm going to be a very different leader. Um, I'm going to be my best version. I'm going to maintain that version. Like I'm going to talk about it. And then this guy was a strength and conditioning coach, paid his 12 grand, probably told everybody around him that he's going to come back this new man. And on day one, a strength and conditioning coach. Day zero. Day zero. Day zero. Day zero. I'm sorry. Day zero, which was the first four hours of mm -hmm. the project. He was army crawling across the turf. And he quit. He raised his hand and said, why is that? 
it's not even the physical problem, even though he, whether or not he was in good enough shape or not, doesn't matter. We've had people in worse shape than him that made it through, right? Yep. It is not a physical thing. The, the physical shit is hard. That's impossible. It's some of the stuff that we have them do is just impossible to do. It's, and, and that's by, I couldn't by do design. It. Yes. I couldn't do something. You know, you can't, you can't do certain things for a certain amount of time. No human in the world can. Yeah. But are you a fucking quitter? That's where it taps into the mental and the emotional. Yeah. The physical part is easy. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. It's just, are you a quitter is what it comes down to. Are you, do you have the, emo- are you emotionally strong enough? Are you mentally strong enough and have enough resilience to, to fight through it and keep going even when your body wants to stop because your body can't do it anymore? Because that's the, that, the physical part is the easiest part. So, so let's talk about a, a couple of things and I want your guys' feedback, just your own expert okay. experience. Uh, and we don't have to throw out any names of the quitters. I, I don't think that's cool to do. But uh, let's talk about the guy who was, he ran a massive hospital Mm. It was day zero. We were at the beach. Um, definitely one of those exercises where it's just designed to fatigue you to no end. It doesn't matter if you're Jason Khalifa, uh, you know, top CrossFit champion. He was going to, at some point, Jason would get fatigued. This guy got fatigued, raised his hand, and he quit. What do you guys think he quit when he could run a massive hospital with all these doctors under his jurisdiction? Well, I, I can start by, let's go back to the onboarding process of this is you have to, we actually bring you into a, 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 a trainer eyes, which is a structured workout application where all of us give you detailed PT, right? Physical training activities to do daily. Well, what he didn't seem to understand is, is that we can see who's checking in. Well, I'll let you know a little secret. He wasn't doing it. Mm. He wasn't prioritizing thing. He was running this big hospital, you know, and he was overweight. You know, that that's still not even a factor of it. But he was so good at doing one thing, running a hospital and doing whatever it is with running a hospital, that he just, I think in his mind, he showed up going, well, if I can do that, I can do this. He wasn't prepared. And, you know, and what I what I can't stand is people that pay the money and they think they're already going to go, you know, go, sh- you know, get have that get out of jail free card. No. You know, I like to see the people, you know, because I'm one of the the people that they constantly, you know, we have the WhatsApp, inundate me with questions, inundate me with concerns. Let me help you because that's the thing. We're not here, even Steve, we're not here to fail people. What we're here to do is we're here to weed out the weak. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to do. So he just wasn't, he didn't mentally put in the time to physically prepare, if that makes sense. So what does that tell us about him, his lifestyle? I mean, I mean, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing from that is, I mean, here's a guy who could run a multi-million dollar mm-hmm. hospital, be the director of it, lots of pressure he can deal with, uh, vendors, he's got doctors, he's got people dying, mm-hmm. and I'm sure he's getting questioned why he runs the hospital a certain way. He's got such control there, but look how out of control he was mentally and physically. So does, does that is that a successful person who has such control here, but no control in those two areas. I think he's probably in the wrong, doesn't have a circle of people around him, has a, probably a bunch of yes men around him, right? No one that's ever calling him out on his bullshit. He's just used to barking orders, telling people what to do, kind of a top-down dictatorship. That's what I'm getting. I don't know that for a fact. That's just what I see it, how mm-hmm. I would see it. Because how could someone be that successful in one area, but fall apart in other areas? It's just he's used to that, not used to being told what to do, can't handle it. It's an ego thing, not prepared thinking that they paid the money. We had another gentleman, not, not the one you're talking about, ask before it even started if he could bring his wife to the graduation dinner. Oh, like, that's whoa, right. whoa, 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 don't oh, start was... talking about a graduation dinner. You haven't even fucking showed up yet, and you're talking about, you know, I knew right off the bat, that guy wasn't making it. And surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, he was a dinger. Yeah. The people that do that are lacking something in their life. You know, we've talked about it before, the, the four F-bombs, the family, the fitness, the finance, and faith, right? I got a tattooed on my hand. And the thing is, is just because you're good at one of those things, you know, you can be an A-plus student, but if you're failing at the rest of them, you know, that is not a, you're not going to have a passing grade to show up. And that's why we try to get the candidates ahead of time to come in, you know, hey, don't just, you know, pay the money and show up. Like, hey, join up now and let's prep you for our November class. So you can do that self-assessment test on what you're lacking, right? We make you fill out the survey, we read it and then go, hey, this is what I would recommend you do. We gave him the tools to pass. He just, could it be arrogance? Could it be, I don't know what it could have been. Maybe it could it be self-sabotage. Self-sabotage, just, but he, his, I think what he did was he was like, I'm so good at doing this that I can just do that. And I'm here to tell you, you have to be well-rounded to come to the project. Mm. Even with, you know, everybody has kryptonites. He just had too many of them. And I think a lot of that was, when people do that, to me, their kryptonite is that's an ego. They're not willing to step out of their comfort zone until it's too late. Yeah. 
and and he's used to delegating, right? You Ugh. can't delegate your character. No. You can't delegate no. your your fitness and your health. <laughs> you can't delegate your health. You just can't do it. You could go and pump yourself with all the steroids you want, but if you're still the same mental and emotional wreck that you were, you're not delegating it. Yep. Those are two things you can't delegate, and you can't delegate accountability. You can delegate tasks and jobs and even power for someone to do to take charge. You could delegate leadership, but that doesn't mean you delegated accountability. You still have to be accountable for it in the end, and that's what he, he I think, believes that it's just going to be done. It's just a given because I'm used to delegating. I'm in power. There's certain things you can't delegate. There's certain non-negotiables that are up to you no matter what, no matter how big and powerful you get. And so that brings up another guy who um, I had come back from my sleep break. And I go, oh. hey, where's this guy? My sleep break. The fuck pa- is Papa that? Papa Bear needs his sleep break. And that's why you come back and they get all happy and they start By smiling because the they know you're going to come and save them. But you should see your face. when I Because I know when you're, I could see in your eyes when you're when you're ready to go. And I go whisper in their ears. I'm like, you see that look in his eyes? His eyes are getting glassy. I mean, he, 30 minutes, he's out of here. <laughs> he, Papa Bear's gone in 30 minutes. You're fucking mine. He ain't coming back for till, till the morning time. And you're going to be here with me all uh, night. Was that the class when you like cut out caffeine too? You were, yes, the you January. Were like, like I live off of yeah. caffeine, you know, and like yeah. Steve eats real natural. Me, I'm I run off of coffee. Give me coffee. I did a and, caffeine detox a right detox, in the middle and of I that was class. Like, yeah. I thought to myself, I was like, why? In the yeah. Surprisingly, that was the one we had the highest dropout rate because Papa Bear needed to go take he, his naps. He had no his caffeine. Nap. He was I was like, like, yes, no caffeine. These <laughs> motherfuckers are going down. But you did every time you leave and come back. Somebody more people gone. were gone. They were gone. And one guy that comes into mind because I really thought like he had what it took, man. Like he was he was he was built. <clears throat> He definitely had that hard look about him. And I'm like, what did you guys do to get rid of this guy? And both of you said nothing. He, we put him down to sleep. They got their two hours of sleep. He sat up and raised his two hand. Two times in a row we he had. Said we to, had he said to me, wake up talk? and drop. He, we go and he, we're, we're causing chaos and commotion, right? Steve is screaming. We're flipping things. And all of a sudden, this guy, everybody's up. He's sitting there and he raises his hand. He goes, instructor, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, like and Steve's yelling and he sees out of the corner of my eye. He's like, I'm like, yeah, sure. Come on with me. And he's like, yeah, this isn't for me. And the reason for that, I, and I told you this before, like in Hell Week, staying awake for five days, people think it's, in, it's insane. It's not. What's insane is laying us down for 30 minutes where we start thinking, mm-hmm. where we have to. I don't want to think when I'm going for 75 hours. What's so great about this course is you know exactly how long you have to go. Yes, we don't tell you what time it is. But like if I'm smart enough, I go, okay, the sun's got to come up three times. That's all I got to do. And Hell Week, you know, I start losing, you start losing, you know, you get uh, delirious, you lose track of everything. And the thing is, is I told you, you just got to hang in there. But these guys, as soon as you give people time to relax, what do they do? They get comfortable. And we do this on purpose. You know, everything that we do, you know, Steve says it, we control the chaos with everything we do. As much, like sometimes it seems like we don't know what we're doing. Like a lot of times Steve and I are running the, the, the chaos. We know we're feeding off of each other. And the, the trick to being successful with this is you need, you need to know how to redline people at all their emotions, the mental, the physical, emotion, social, and spiritual. Just, and then spiritual, I mean, testing themselves. And we redline them, and as soon as we get them to the red, like, we have little, they, they'll never see it, but we know how to back each other off. Like, Steve will be doing something, and I'll interrupt him, or he'll interrupt me, because that's why we always have two instructors, because you have to have that, that 20,000 foot versus the on-ground commander who's just destroying everything, I see when people were, were, were pushing that barrier too far, we pull them back, we let them regroup. Even though I seem like I'm being kind, it's actually hard because once they we, we rev them down again, then we're going to build them back up. So we're, we're constantly doing this with them, keeping them right at the peak of their performance. So it's not, um, but, but, but I still want to get, Steve, let me get your opinion. Like this guy who sat up and got raised attention. Instructor, can I talk to you for a moment? Actually, happened two times in a row. Two two. two classes in a row. There was a wake up and drop. Why do you think that is? Like what's happening in their head since you? That's what I was going to say. It's all in their head. It's, it's, that's their, they finally had a chance. They're laying down. And I, and I just mentioned it about this whole thing is going right now with the whole lockdown. That this, it's the first chance that someone has that they're sitting still. They're not able to stay busy and distract themselves with a bunch of other bullshit that's going on. And in their head, they're finally having some self-reflection and some self-awareness and like realizing either I'm a little bitch, I hate my life, I can't do this, I'm not capable of doing this. They start telling themselves all this stuff and it brings out the worst of them. Instead of during that time of reflection being like, you know what, the last fucking 15, 16 hours of nonstop, 
this was fucking awesome. I can't wait to get back to this again. This is shit I never had a chance to do in my life. I'm, I'm so lucky that I'm able to pay to come here, fly out here healthy enough to get through this day that instead of sitting down like that and reflecting on the positive, they let it bring out the, you either let rough situations bring out the best in you and the worst in you. There's no in between. Because the, the guys that graduate, that make it to the end, fucking studs, yeah. studs. Yeah. And the ones yeah, that absolutely. don't, they let that adversity, and it's the same thing going on right now. You see people on social media, either they're being heroes or, like, stepping up and leading like you're doing right now with your franchise, like, out of the, like, extraordinary, or just rotten, miserable fucks that are just letting it bring out the worst them, yeah. worse than ever, because they're finally realizing <laughs> they don't have it. They're jealous of the people that do have it and are stepping up and not crumbling. They don't like their life. They probably don't, maybe don't like their family, even as, as harsh as it sounds. And they start getting that, that one second to think and they get stuck in their own head and they've had those patterns of negative talk in their head. And that's exactly what happens with them. They're, they're laying there. They're not sleeping during that time we give them. Right. They're laying there in their own head and they're, and they're done. So to that point, actually, you know, anyone that thinks that it's 75 hours of straight up physical work, it's not. We have a lot of desk time where I'm teaching entrepreneurism and leadership and and you guys are teaching some really high level stuff, which also gives them a time to refuel and get some coffee. And then, of course, we, we start pounding them again. Um, one of the one of the best desk times uh, that I like is the one that you run where they get to ultimately in their battle book. Everyone gets a battle book, a modern day night battle book when they graduate but they put three pictures of themselves in that battle book. Why don't you explain what those three pictures are and what, what it means? It's the three versions of, them, of themselves. The, and this goes right, this perfect feeds right into what we were saying because they bring out either the best or the worst themselves. It's their, a picture of them at their worst, their bitch picture, a picture of them at their best, the best version of themselves, that's their night picture, and then their beast picture. That's just their savage who we all, all the men have it in them. It's just in our DNA who we need to call upon, we just need to learn how to control the beast. So it's their bitch, their knight, and their savage. And they put those in there. They actually, we, we create an avatar for each of those. They describe them. We go real in depth. In we detail. name them, right? They give them names mm -hmm. so that they can actually call upon those. I'll call upon my bitch sometimes to help me get through a, a tough time. Because you think of yourself as the worst version of yourself. You mean you call upon your beast? No, my bitch. Your bitch. Sometimes it depends on the situation and what you, and it's just, you'd have a gut instinct because is that who you want to be again? Is that who you want to, you want to, this situation, if you don't, Step up and take charge right now. That's who you're going to be. Picture that bitch in your head. All you have to do is say that name in your head because you've already done the work and and the, the way that we go real de in depth with it. All it takes is just that trigger in your head, that bitch name, that picture of the bitch. Mm -hmm. Hell no. Who wants it? Do you want to be the worst version of yourself again? That's all. Sometimes that's all the motivation you need. Sometimes you think of the beast version. Sometimes the night version. Depending on the situation, you have these triggers that are going to help you through anything. And that's all that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that gentleman didn't even make it to that portion. That's on, I don't even know, day two or whatever it is, day nine or ten. Yeah. Feel, feels like that, right? It's on day nine of a four-day yeah. experience. Yep. So they, that's what they we teach them how to call upon those. So when they get back to those moments, when they get back to the, the viruses and they're stuck at home, call upon those. Call upon the night. Call upon the beast when it's time to. Don't go back and revert to the worst version of yourself. Learn how to trigger the best version of yourself. So and I don't want to give away any of the evolutions because that's kind of the secret sauce that we use. And, and I don't want to really ruin the experience for any men who are watching this and listening to this who are going to come and experience it. Uh, but let's talk about one of the evolutions, physical evolutions, that, that I think really gives people a big aha moment, which is attack the hill. The attack the hill evolution is, is one of my favorite ones because these guys, you know, we give them all backpacks and those backpacks are loaded up with some crazy stuff, bo uh, body bags and shovels and stuff that they're gonna use. Um, and of course, later on, we they have heavy logs that each weigh about 200 pounds and giant battle ropes that they carry around in this, in these hills that we hike out here. But right when they're tired, as we get to a hill, as instructors, you guys have them charge up those hills. Mm -hmm. like during, And I find it fascinating because as I'm watching, as we're going and I'm watching and I'm always observing, as we're going on a straightaway, you can just hear them muttering to themselves. And some people are positive, some are negative. Some, some you hear the, the, the bitch negotiation begins and others are starting to summon up the inner beast. But they're all tired and fatigued and slumped along when we're just walking straight on a level, level ground. Yeah. And then we, we get to the bottom of a hill and you guys make them attack the hill. Yep. What is the purpose of that? Let me take that. Oh, the, the weight and the hill is representation of life. And what we've been trying to do and what I try to do is I want to reverse engineer the way people think. So like you said, 
people usually just stroll through life, right? In the perfect world, it's just, it's nice, calm, uh, straight gradient. But then when they see the hill, what do they do? They slow down, they make excuses, they try to find ways around it, and they walk up the hill. And then what most people do is they run, they let gravity, mm. external sources control them going down. And my motto to that, my mindset is, fuck it, fuck you. No, that's not how it's gonna work, B. It's, you know what, I see this hill, right? I wanna be the best at what I'm gonna do. And the thing, what I, how I like to reverse engineer things is, you know, we've talked about this before. I love doing burpees, I love doing pull-ups. People hate doing things that are hard and it's, there's gotta be a reason. But the thing is, is once you master it, I see why they didn't wanna do it because the journey to get there is hard, but then once you're to the top, it's like, okay, what's next? So we started doing that. We just all were talking about it one day and you know, the candidates are just walking along and they're bitching and we run up the hill. They don't get it the first time and they go down, we do it again. And finally, someone, something in their head clicks and goes, why are these guys running up this hill? Well, I'll tell you why you run up the hill. The thing is, is you, you guys are meat eaters, you know, you're beast. You're not, bitches walk up the hill. Beast attack the hill. Mm. They get to the top, and when they get to the top, they control the descent, right? Because a lot of injuries will happen if you run down the hill, that's where you get injuries because you're Panic. letting something yeah. control you. My thing is just control the outcome of, of your destiny. And this is what I'll tell you, we can actually do another drill. You can walk up the hill and run down it, and I'll run up the hill and walk down it, the opposite, and I'll beat you every time. And the thing is, is once you get to the top, What's so great about that is you haven't accomplished jack shit. What you do is you have to regroup. That's why I walk down and I'm looking for another hill because if you start taking that mindset and that approach to life, that attack the hill mindset, you are gonna be more dominant in everything you do with your family, your fitness, your finance, and your faith. And the people that need to come here, the people that succeed the most are the ones that start attacking the hill. And we've had men from 22 to 55 who have led their life by doing just the opposite. They were walking up the hill or worse, worse. They were trying to find an alternate means. Mm. Fuck that, B, you gotta run up the hill and come down it. And ima imagine if, if you, you took that approach and that mentality of everything in life, yep. everything that everyone else was afraid of, times got hard, the, the fucking virus and pandemic and everyone else is running away from it. There's yep. gunfire. Imagine if you're the only one running towards gunfire because the average man is cowering and hiding away because right. it's, it's scary, it's hard, it's difficult. Imagine if you had that mentality of attacking the hill. You know what that makes you? If, if you're willing to do what everyone else is afraid to do and what everyone else is scared scared to do and not willing to do, that makes you unbeatable. It makes you yeah. fucking bulletproof. Yeah. It makes you be able to, you'll be the last one standing when the dust settles. You will be the only one standing to then just dominate and be a modern day knight. Yeah, and be that, that fuck it, fuck you. When I say that, like if you told me to run up the hill, I'm gonna say fuck it, fuck you, but I'm not saying that to you. I say it to myself mentally. It's like, fuck it, I'm here. I just made the commitment, you know, I know it's time to invest in myself, so fuck it, I'm here. I might as well just absorb this knowledge. And the fuck you, this is what people don't understand. The fuck you is what I'm saying to myself. To that inner bitch. To that inner bitch, mm -hmm. because you know, I was like that for the longest time until I finally accepted that I was a bitch. Even as a Navy SEAL, I still had bitch qualities until I just use that mentality to start attacking the hill with everything. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here with you guys right now, two mentors, two friends, entrepreneurs, seven figure business owners, if not eight, when I'm a dumb Irish kid, because I just literally said, you know what, enough's enough. I am not gonna hold back anymore. I'm gonna take chance and I'm gonna attack every hill that I go at, you know? Phone calls with Gunnar Peterson, just, hey, this is who I am, this is what I do. Meeting people, going out, creating new relationships, and this program is exactly designed to do that. Whatever you set your goals to, what you learn in these 75 hours, what these guys teach you, not, to, not just me, you can apply to anything in your everyday life. And it's one of those things where, you know, I had a guy reach out to me on DM actually right before we started this on Instagram. He said, hey, $12,000 for 75 hours, like that's a little steep. Mm. And I was like, well, you know, if you graduate, it's $12,000 for the rest of your life yeah. because you're part of a brotherhood. And I said, this July, we're all going to Vegas, assuming Vegas opens up. If mm -hmm. not, we'll find another place to go. So, but we're all meeting up in Vegas and spending two and a half days in Vegas, like hiking in Red Rock and yeah. playing top golf and having a good time, you know, hanging out in the pool cabanas and just really building each other up. Like you're part of a brotherhood of some elite dudes. Mm -hmm. um, from entrepreneurs to, to, to dudes that have been in the military to one dude who's a Google executive mm -hmm. who's, in, who's in, the, in the modern day night brotherhood. And so, so to that point, of course, 
One thing we quickly found is, as now we're going into class number 05 of the project next month, um, as some of these men were graduating and they have businesses, they started to reach out to you guys and were like, hey, you know, now I want my employees to get a dose of this. I want my employees to be able to have direct communication, to be able to be emotionally tough, mentally resilient, be amazing leaders. So I want them to be able to lead themselves and lead my business and my clients and customers. And so out of that, mm -hmm. you created the LTD yes. project, leadership and team development, mm -hmm. uh, where you guys have flown out to many different businesses and work with teams. What is the LTD project all about? Well, it actually started by after the project graduates, they would graduate, they'd go back with this whole new mentality of operating and they, they would call us not asking us to come out at first, they'd call us with their struggles, with their That's problems. Right, yeah. They're like, I'm a whole new person, I've developed myself, I've elevated myself, mm -hmm. but my team doesn't get it, they don't get it. They're not on that same wavelength, what do I do now? Now I'm, I'm fucked because I can't even stand to be around them anymore because I'm operating at such a high level, high octane freaking jet fuel and they're putting syrup in their gas tank, so what do I do? We said, you know what? You've left them behind. We need to level them up. We need to get them thinking the same way as you can. We talked about it and we said, you know what? Let's start going out there and giving them the, the team leadership and teamwork. They're basically getting a lot of the, the traits and a lot of the lessons learned from the project without the hanging by the nuts. Yeah, yeah. without the beat downs and yeah. the deprivation of sleep and food and all that but stuff. But we still expose weaknesses and deficiencies and that's our key. We go in there and we call companies out for what they're doing wrong. And what's so unique about that, what we do is we bring the battlefield to the business field, to the home field. You can apply all three applications to everything that you do. But what I love is Steve and I'll go in there, you know, and we focus on the four pillars of success. Teamwork, problem solving, leadership, and communication just like the four F-bombs, family, fitness, finance, and faith. And what we do is we have drills, hands-on applications, which can be customizable. Steve is a master programmer where it can be physical or not physical, depending on the crew. And what we do is we, we hit each one of those, those pillars because what we do is we, we reach out to the CEO beforehand and then we send uh, surveys out and we try to see where we're seeing some overlapping fields of fire where there's issues. So Steve and I collect that data and we go, okay, sir, your company, you know, we came out to you and this is what we're seeing we need to do. This is how we're going to attack this hill. And we do this. And what we do is we, we want the CEO there to see where they're lacking in the communication, the problem solving, teamwork and communication. And that's great. But then what we do is then we apply applications and drills and homework that you can do to better yourself because it would be no good if we just went there and told you what you did wrong. Sure. And a lot of companies do that. You know, you're fucked up. Okay, great, now, but how do I fix right. it? That's why yeah. I hired you. Yeah. So that's what we do. We come in and we fix the problem. Let's talk about that for a moment. When, when a company hires you guys to go out there, whether it's for a, a full day or two day experience, um, and I know it's very customizable because you guys did this for our Fit Body Bootcamp staff and it was a really fun experience for them. They enjoyed it. There's so much learning they got out of it and teamwork. How often, because I imagine, now I know better because I work with you guys within the project and I always assume that I just show up with a white belt, like I'm not the best leader yet, I'm gonna become better, and so I always know that 99% of the time I'm probably the problem. But how often do people reach out to you saying, come and fix my team? Like, everything's good with me, I'm a good leader, they're just a stupid team, come, fi come fix them. And what do you guys find in that scenario? We'll still send out the surveys, and the surveys will come back with data that we're pretty, we're, we're pretty certain was gonna happen, that usually where the leader thinks that their team sees them, it's conf very conflicting and that's really? and we'll present that with them and sometimes we'll even tell the ceo they should participate in it because a lot of times they should they should be in the trenches with them because maybe they've been too far detached and they've lost the, the lost the, the feel of what's going on in their company they've lost really the touch with it they don't have that touch anymore so that's what we do is even show them that data like you think you're this great high leader let's see what let's see with the people that you're leading because if you're a great leader, they would agree with you. Or if, you have, if you're a great communicator, or you're a great problem solver, or whatever else it is, if you're empathetic, we have a whole long questionnaire we send them, and we send it to all the participants, and we also ask the leader where they see themselves mm -hmm. with all this stuff, and we see where it's conflicting, and that's how we'll base the program off of it. And who else is calling that leader out on their bullshit? Yeah. We're not afraid to do it. Right. That's our job. That's what we're paid to do. That's what they yeah. want. Most of them want us to do it, because most of the, most of the people that have us come out there, they know that they have the wherewithal to know that they're lacking in some areas. That's why they have us come out there. The ones that think that it's not them really don't even have us come out higher. They're the ones that need us the most. But a lot of times after we go through the, mm. the interview with them, 
oh no, I could do that for them myself. You know, they think that's what they yeah, would think. I the know. ego, it's the ego of that. The ego. And I like what you said from a martial arts standpoint. You know, you have belts, which is levels, right? You have white, blue, purple, brown, and belt. And then you usually have three stripes per. Well, the CEO is prop, considers himself or is a black belt and he worked his way up there. But I like your approach is, hey, you know, I'm a CEO, but I'm still a white belt in training or I'm a blue belt in training. What happens is, is these guys get to this level we've noticed and they don't use those skill sets anymore. And like we talked about, it's perishable. So in their eyes, they're a black belt, but maybe their team's looking at them like, what the hell are you doing? You don't know what the hell you're doing or you're so one dimensional with your thinking. Mm. And a lot of CEOs that we've noticed cannot stand criticism. You know, but we tell them when we come in here, we're going to give you an outside perspective on things. And here's the thing. We don't we don't care if you like it or not. You know, we're subject matter experts in this. And, and obviously we're going to do it politically, but we're going to tell you what the problem is, even if that problem's you. And, you know, sometimes it's a gut check for CEOs. And we tell, you know, hey, remember when you were down here and you were you were working your way up, you know, like me, I'm new, new to the business world. I love criticism. Tell it to me. You, you've you got to drop the ego. That's the main thing we tell you. You've got to drop the ego and the attitude, and you just got to get back to, like I said, you're not the CEO of a company. You're, you are a CEO or you're the team leader, and you have troops or you have soldiers. It's one team, one fight, mm. and you've got to have that mentality to be successful. Now, is there a couple of areas that when you guys go into a business that you can almost pinpoint and say, all right, we're going to do this with, with their employees and this is the results they're going to get. Is there a couple of areas that you know that every business who has employees need fixing or educating on? Communication. 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 Always. 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 Always, always communication. There's yeah. always communication problems. That's with, there was Harvard studies. Ray knows some of these st statistics better than I do. But what was the biggest problem even with the CEOs? And it was their self-awareness. They thought they were great communicators. They thought they were great leaders. And again, the study showed because the study's been done not even just by our surveys it's been done massively like industry tons of industries they had don't have the self-awareness to realize that they are poor communicators and communication is always the huge one what's yeah. the what's the stat for communication for the businesses over 80 over 85 percent of businesses fail because of not poor leadership but because of poor communication Oof. and what we do is we go in there and i have a drill and i've, I've done it with every team I have a communication drill with the ceo standing there I give them four words and I said, you know, you give me 20 people, 20 people. If, if not, we make it smaller. You will not pass this. We have done this. I don't know how many times all across the country. Not one company has passed it and not one company will because the CEO lives sometimes with these blinders on thinking, oh, just because I put out a corporate email once a week, people are reading it. I could give you statistics on how many emails are read start to finish. I even have a drill for that for the CEOs. And they're like, I can't do that. I'm like, do it. Mm. and see who's going to confront you on what you wrote wrong, hint, hint, wink, wink, and see if they do that. Because if someone cares about you and you have that, that mission, they're gonna come up and say, excuse me, sir, just so you know, you mistyped something or you put the word, you put the wrong word in this. Thank you, at least you know. I mean, is it extreme? Yes, but sometimes you need extreme because we've been to companies where we've had junior employees that have been there for six months they don't know what the team, what they don't know what your core value is. They don't know the, how many revenue streams you have and what else. Or even what the revenue streams are. Or even are. what the revenue streams are. You know, like, hey. That's, that's straight up we, dangerous. We own Fit business. Body Boot Camp. How, so it would be like me working here for six months, you saying that, you know, you may have four or five different revenue streams and me going, well, I've been here for six months. He has one revenue stream, selling memberships. As a CEO, you should go, what the fuck? What do you mean? So my thing is, is people don't have your core value. They don't, they don't know what your core values are and they don't know how many ways that you are able to make money. How are they, how are they producing for you the way that they need to be? Mm -hmm. And then as a leader, we're going to go in and go, whose fault is that? Is that your fault or their fault? It's got to be and yours, that's, right? That's yeah. right, yeah. right? Goes back to that accountability. That's, that's, that's right. the leader's fault. We've had CEOs on, this, on one of the communication drills willing to bet their salary that their team would get it because they were so sure. <laughs> and it's like about a 20-step process and their team made it to step one. Step one. Luckily, I'm not a betting man anymore. Yeah. Yeah, well. Not only do they get the words wrong, but they're not even the same words. Three single syllable words, one double syllable word. I'll even give everybody the, the secret. Three single syllable words, one double syllable word. When we're done, we have over what, 60, 70% of companies that don't even get one of the words right. That's great. How are you producing and making outcome if you can't do that? So let's, uh 
let, let, let's shift gears for a moment to um, going back to the project again. <laughs> You're laughing. It's going to be good. Well, <laughs> in the short amount of time that we've been doing the project, it's, it's coming on to a year now, we've had some hysterical moments. Oh. We've had some hysterical moments, and some of those moments can't even be shared here. It just it can't be. When you, when, you, when you do the project, you graduate, you don't ring the bell and leave, um, you'll be privy to those hysterical moments because we always talk about them, laugh about them. So I could only imagine in your military careers, mm -hmm. there had to be some hysterical moments that uh, you guys experienced. And having never been in the military, I feel like I've always kind of missed out on that piece. Um, is there any like hysterical, funny, interesting, weird moments in your military career? I don't even want to hear Ray's. I don't even want to hear what Ray has to say. I'm curious to what Ray's going to come up with. But it's what Ray, Ray and I talked about earlier today. Actually, was the harder shit gets when we're in the military. To, and to think of a, I'm not sure if I could think of a specific s scenario. But every time stuff got harder, the harder the work we had, we're filling sandbags out in the sun in the desert in, in Arizona for 12 hours straight. The harder the, the harder the, the more adversity we have. The more fun we have, the funnier we get, the more creative we get. We're cracking jokes more. Like, look on the project. Like, the brilliance we come up with when, during the project. We, we laugh about it. We, we talk about it for months, about the things that go on that we come up with. We, didn't, we don't pre-plan any of that stuff. It's the adversity creates this, this new level of thought and creativity in you and, like, brilliance almost. It's crazy. Like, it is. if you go into it with that type of mindset, like, the harder shit gets in the military, the more fun we have, the more shit we talk. We're just having a good old time. If someone looks from the outside... They'd be like, these, what the fuck is wrong with these Marines? They're like being tortured for weeks at a time, and we're sitting there doing it, just cracking jokes, talking shit. It's just having a, good, having a blast. A bl the harder it gets, the more fun we have. And I just know that would happen all the time. That was like the best times <laughs> were, were, were born off of the worst times. Hmm. That's hmm. fascinating. How about you? <laughs> or some interesting I don't want to hear it. I don't even want to hear it. <laughs> well, cut, the, not, cut the cameras. I'm not going to tell my third phase story that made me legendary, but I will tell this one story. I was a junior guy and we went to Albania on an ice climbing trip, and it was super, super cold. So what we did was we built like ice ice shanties, so, you know, holes in the ground. The snow's like six, seven feet deep, and we made it big so there was like four of us in there. I mean, you can build fires, you can do everything under there. And at night, what we do is we heat up those, and I was telling you about the Nalgene bottles, right? You, yeah. you boil water and you put the Nalgene bottle in your sleeping bag and you throw it in there and it keeps you warm, and it's freezing. It's like minus God knows what. Well, one night I had to get up and go to the bathroom. Not number one, but number two. And it was so cold that I, I swore, no, I swore I, know where I going. wasn't going to get up. I was just going to hold it, and I couldn't hold it anymore. So in the middle of the night, <laughs> listen, I built a small fire, <laughs> and my lieutenant wakes up to me, hovering over top the Nalgene bottle, trying to go to the bathroom. So the platoon threw me out in the, it was like literally minus I don't know what, with barely any clothes on. It made me stay out there until I almost froze to death and then brought me bring, <laughs> come back in. And my lieutenant told me, if you ever do that again, I will literally kick you out of the So wait, were you trying to take a shit in the fire or the bottle? I was trying to take bottle? a shit into the bottle, into the bottle, but I didn't want to turn the light on. So you used so the I fire. Built, the fire was in the corner, so I built a little fire real quick. It wasn't hard. And then well, I guess someone heard me, and my lieutenant, when he got up, he was like, what the fuck? And he just saw a shadow of me hovering over a giant Nalgene bottle trying to go to the bathroom. There must be shit like this just triggered a story for me. It's fine. There must be shit problems all across the All over the world. Like, it's all about shit. He said this, and a fucking story just from boot camp, just, I never even thought about this story since then. It's fucking crazy. We're out in the field, like a three-week out in the field there, so there was a port of shitter right there, right, <laughs> that we use, because we you're throwing shit out, and like, you're doing training, you're not going to shit in the holes all the time for training. So, there's a one port of shitter for like 50, 60 guys. Middle of the night, you got to get your battle buddy if you want to go take a piss yep. or take a dump or whatever. Someone goes and whatever. We wake up in the morning, the drill instructors Literally, there's just an explosion. The porta potties just exploded. Shit everywhere. They're having to clean it up. They're having to fucking deal with it. One of the one of the guys went to go take a shit. I guess it was out of toilet paper in the middle of the night. Was too afraid to go tell anyone about it. Used his jock strap to wipe his ass. Put it in the thing, and it clogged the whole thing up. And the shit went everywhere, all over the place. So his and. He didn't think about it in the military. What do they do with all your gear? They label everything. Fucking dumb fuck. His label, his name is stenciled oh. in it. So when the company finally came and everyone's covered in shit, dealing out, they see this jock strap with this fucking idiot's name stenciled right across it. So his name, the rest of boot camp was shitty, shitty, bang, bang. <laughs> yeah. My oh, moral to the story is imagine if I would have just attacked the hill, got dressed, got up and went out and did it. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to cut corners. And literally the time that I wasted making a fire, 
and trying to, like, you know, be the bombardier to get it because the hole was only, like, that big. So I'm, like, hovering over it, trying to get it done. And it's, like... The sick part is I can totally picture that happening, like, modern day. Like, today. I can can picture him coming up with that today. And right before the lieutenant woke up, all right, we'll just call him Lieutenant N. I don't want to say his name. He's retired now. He was a Commodore. I'm literally going, oh, my God. What am I doing? And what happens if someone wakes up and all of a sudden I heard, <laughs> what the fuck? And I was like, oh, God, I'm dead. And they did. They just literally picked me up and threw me out there. Obviously, I went to the bathroom and I was, I mean, I had no clothes on, just like a pair of, you know, you wear silkies so you can stay warm. And I literally almost froze to death. They, I mean, they had a fire waiting for me, but I'll tell you what, what never again. What a lesson. Um, what, what, what's your favorite evolution from the project? Oh, that, is, that is a tough one. Favorite evolution. I like it in the beginning, in the beginning. Well, I don't want to even say what it is. When we, when we first pick them up. Gotcha. Their initiation. Their initiation, yeah. First, that first, like, realizing that they're now under our control. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That's, that's that. What, it's, I'm a shock. it's a shock. For me, them. it's, I know I don't want to say what we do with the ice bass, but it's when they finally let go of the bitch and we make them do something over and over, and every time they come up, we get more, ah, it's more. Like, I, 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 I see the change, I hear the change, I feel the change, I get goosebumps. And I'm like, it's so rewarding, you know, that we're, even with the torture that they're going through their bodies, they block it out and they, they finally get it. It's like someone turns on a switch. Sim- and, similar is the second round of the pugil sticks. Yeah, or yes. exactly. Not giving too much weight. Yeah. The first one, they're afraid to get hit, afraid to hit someone, never hit anyone before in their life, maybe, never been hit before, think they're going to die, they don't know what's going to happen. And then the next thing you know, I'm throwing them in there with two, three guys, half their, double, twice their size, and they're just going fucking beast mode. And Helmets the day they before, can't see, swinging. The day before, they were yeah. all fucking scared, and now they're just laying motherfuckers out because they realize this is what it's all about. This yeah. is how I kill the inner bitch and unleash the beast yeah. under my control. And or semi under my control. What about you? You know, let me be the interviewer for a second, you know? Hi, this is Ray Kerr, introducing, uh, interviewing Benjo Schooling. What is your favorite part of the evolution of what we do? Uh, well, I, actually, for, for me, it is, uh, it's the burial. It's, it's okay. the burial, the body bags. You know, I'm sure everyone's wondering, like, what do, what do you mean by body bags? And we put enough videos yeah. out there. Um, but when you really think about it, you're, you're, you're born on a certain date, and then you're going to die on a certain date in the future. Mm-hmm. There's that little dash in the middle. Yeah. That on your, they put on your tombstone that you were born on this date, died on this date, and while that dash just separates two dates, that dash is responsible for decades of life, and some of those people, the life that they had, was it worth living? Mm-hmm. And others, like what significance did you have? What impact did you have? Who did you, who did you love up? Who did you pour into? Yeah. What did you do to leave a legacy behind? And so that burial that we do, where we, well, they have to build, you know, dig their own grave and and go into the body bag and we're not going to explain what happens next, <laughs> but to be able to have that rebirth, yeah. like that's when I see the switch flip on every single one of those guys that like I'm the next time I'm in that body bag, it's going to be real. I'm going to be dead. And when I am, I'm not going to die with regret. I love it. And I think that's one of the things that I like seeing go away. Cause you can tell every guy that shows up, l- listen, like every one of us, like I've, I've suffered in silence. I've, I've given up on things and then regret it quitting things and thinking like, man, why did I quit when it got hard? That's when I should have pushed, that's when I should have gotten hard. I quit when it got hard instead of me getting hard. Um, and that regret can stick with you. Bryce, our VP, um, you know, this guy, he, in high school, he was supposed to run something, uh, I forget what it was, like some cross country thing for his soccer club that he was in. And he just didn't do it and they, and he gave up on soccer Something like 11 years later. He, he had to make a certain time to get yeah. it because the restrictions. That's what it was. I heard the story. Then he trained for it like over in China, China. or something. Yeah. China. And he came back and yeah. did it. Like, because regret will haunt you. Yeah. Guys, regret will haunt you. And I don't care how much you want to use excuses, come up with like, well, here's why I don't have time to do it. My knees hurt now. 11 years later, he trained for it in China while on some, some kind of school mission. And he did it, and he was like, "I had to get that off my off my check that off my list." But that, yeah, the burial is one of the big. On ones that note, like when, when I'm doing the calls with some of the potential candidates, and you're and you're, we're telling them the prices, right? And they're saying, "Oh my God, that's so expensive for four days." One of the things I tell them, and we're saying, "What's one of our favorite parts?" Of course, at the graduation, right? I tell them, "If you could just fast forward 
to the feelings that you're going to have when you first sit down at the graduation dinner, mm. just that alone, forget about the ongoing stuff that goes on, because you were explaining how it's ongoing for a lifetime. Even without that, let's say that didn't exist. Just that feeling, that moment where they sit down, because we see it when they walk in. We get Ooh. there before them. We see it when they walk in, when they're standing there at their chairs, right before they're about to sit down and realize that they made it and realize everything that we've done to them over that last four days Every single thing had a purpose and had a reason and was to better them, to help build them up to who they need to be, to be that modern day night. That feeling for that split second when they're standing up before they sit down, if you look on their faces, mm -hmm. that alone right there is worth, you would pay a million dollars for that, just for that feeling yeah, for that yeah. one moment, because that one moment is going to change the rest of your life. So that there's no price you could put on that. Agreed. So when they're standing there, that's that's a, a real powerful moment, I think, in the time. We've the saved marriages. We've saved jobs. We've had people take that leap of faith that they want to do. And what I like what Steve was talking about, you know, obviously at graduation, you know, we're in suits. And when they're standing there behind the chairs, because we don't even let them sit right away, right? Everything is orchestrated and structured, right? That chain of command, the, the CEO tells them when to sit. They are not the same people. If people can understand this, in 75 hours, they're not the same men right. that showed up. They're, they're more confident. They're more, the, the, the regret, you know, they know that, th to me, they look like a bunch of lines that are, you're just ready to let loose. The chest is out, heads up straight. They're proud of, you know, everything. And they understand, you know, we talk about the creed, you know, we make them say it. And they don't just say it, they believe in it. You know, they say it yeah. with pride. And, and what we do is when we let them go, we're letting go a whole, like, you, you think it can't be done. That's what I tell people. You know, buds take six months. They're like, it takes you six months to become a SEAL. You can become a SEAL whenever you're ready to become a SEAL. And what we've done is we condensed it into 75 hours. And what we're doing is making people, you know, I tell them the tier one, the Marine, the SEAL, the entrepreneur of whatever it is you want to do, it can be done because we've seen it. We've had guys, I'm not going to say his name up in LA, we'll just leave it at that, who literally said, you know what? I take full responsibility and accountability for the, re the reason why my marriage is on in the fucking crapper. He went home. The next day, he, he, he saw his wife and said, we're going to counseling. He called each and every one of us, and we've seen them all since then. They're doing great. And yep. that, to me, is the ultimate investment, investing in yourself. $12,000 for that? Fucking yeah. steal. Steal. Yeah. Steal of a deal. And, and to that point, we talked about the dinner. Um, you know, it's funny. We talk about how you were just gifted at getting people to quit during the 75 hours of the project and you bring so much so much hell so much hate i literally see hate as papa bear i see hate in their eyes as they look at papa you like just go home go home and take a nap like but a then we do something no you you i do i feel like you, you know what you are you're a combination of him and me i think kind of put together you really do bring the I'm love gonna make somebody i like to say you can't outdick me you just i'm gonna make somebody me. quit at dinner that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna show <laughs> right, both you guys right before the steak dinner's be over I'll be but impressed. to that point where you see all this hate in their eyes because you would just have the sadistic way of keeping that punishment going. During dinner, we have all the guys mm -hmm. review us, rank yes. us as instructors. Yeah. And consistently, every class after every class, they vote you as the number one instructor that they loved. Mm -hmm. And I think, what, what, maybe maybe other than one time. Was it, was it one time, two times? Mm -hmm. Really? It's a, close. Keeping track. it's a close. It's close. It's, it's close. close. It's hard to but compete. But I take the reign because, listen, my goal my goal is to be either one or five. Because there's going to be, there's always going to be a percentage to get five. You'll never get a five. I'll get my fives. I'm looking for my fives. And I'll tell you yeah. what, I'm usually like, you know, one or two. I'm, I am up there, but th this motherfucker is one or five. <laughs> there's no yeah, that's yeah, what I want. That's, that's what I want. That is yeah. true. I'll that give is true. No, it's, it doesn't. And that actually speaks volumes, right? It does. That, that speaks volumes because they realize how much... You, you you were able to influence them in that 75 hours. And you guys are constantly in that top, the, the one or two spots. But yeah, you're right. You're either one I'm or two, kidding. one or two. Yeah, I'm kidding. And you're either one or five. I kind of constantly hold the, 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 the three spot strong. You're yeah. up there a lot of times too. Yeah, I hold the three spot strong. I think we should reverse roles on the next one. Like... I know no other role. This should be like Aaron, the philosophical right. one. <laughs> and you should Here's be like the breathe. crazy one. We'll make Matt the crazy one. And I can just yeah. be... I'll be like a mime. I won't say anything. You won't say anything. Oh, yeah. You just mime your way through. But I think they appreciate it. They like they realize yeah. after because they get to a point, maybe the 60th hour, where my gifts for those that are we that you could tell are going to make it. It doesn't have any effect on them. They love it. They ask for more of it. They ask for more of it. It doesn't affect it. Like 
This is fucking awesome. This is the, I'm so grateful to be here. Steve, give me more. I, this is what I've needed in my whole fucking life. No yeah. one came and bit slapped me and snapped yeah. me out of the, the zombieism that I've been walking through my life with. So they realized that this was done for a fucking reason. Maybe it was done out of a little hate to some people, but in general, it was done for reasons to try and help them and unfuck them. And that's I think they come to appreciate that. I needed this torture. I needed this ass whooping. Case I've had my ass yeah. whooped before, and I, I thank the person for doing that. Case in point, sure the, the graves. The remember graves, remember yeah. the last class? They were digging a rock. Yeah, like on and concrete. And they just loved it because they were like, Steve and the other instructors are not fucking with us. And like, it, we could just hear them digging. They, it was, they weren't resting. Earth. They were just hitting, hitting dirt, just rock. We could see the sparks for hours. We could have left them there for the whole 75 hours. They wouldn't have stopped. You know, it's funny. Let me share this with the audience. Guys, um, The what were the dates? It was March like 8, 9, and 10 or something or 10, 11, 12. Yes. Something like that. Maybe it was 11, 12, 13. But it was right when the coronavirus lockdown was starting to take place, like two days after class 03 of the project graduated, the uh, U.S. went on lockdown. And, you know, one guy was from the Netherlands. Uh, I think another guy was from South Africa. But um, thankfully, he was able to fly out and go back to the Netherlands. But um, that particular class, they got rained on. <laughs> They had no idea that this whole Corona thing was like impacting the world in those 75 hours because, you know, all of their cell phones and communication devices were taken away. Like we knew what was yeah. going on and we're like, well, fuck it. We have to finish. We're here. So we jokingly were calling them the, the Corona class. Mm -hmm. So they got rained on. They were in mud. We had them dig their graves in the worst part of the area that we, I don't know what got into us. We we're like, they're going to dig in fucking asphalt and concrete. And no, and I was thinking... That, all right, some guy's going to quit before they dig their hole. They just, each time they took a swing with that shovel, they got harder and harder and harder, and somehow they were the, they were the build a, a, a hole deep enough to get buried in. Um, and that Corona class still, to me, is like the fucking most badass class, the class zero three. I, I think that shovel is the symbolism, you know, they're chipping away at all the things that, that they, they do regret and the anger yeah. and the doubt. You know, that's why you see some guys, I mean, they get that front sight focus and it could be straight brick and they're, they're going to get there because yeah. it's like you have to dig this hole yeah. for your own good and they will, you know. But well, think about that. When was the last time you were you, you took a shovel at two in the morning and if you've done this, don't admit it because yeah. obviously then you've created a, had a massive crime. There's a bigger issue. When was the last time anyone's taken a shovel at two in the morning and said, I'm going to dig a hole deep enough where I could then go crawl into a body bag and be buried alive with a small little pocket of air to be able to breathe and keep my shit together the whole time and pontificate the dash between when I was born and when I, when I died. Um, and to be able to do that, and like you said, chip away of all the regrets, yeah. of all your fears, of all your bad decisions, of all that suffering in silence, of all the things that made you into that crop duster, mm -hmm. and to know that you have an opportunity to, to rise again as a fighter jet in life is a, is a big thing. So with that said, if um, you know any of our people who want to learn more about the project, you guys just need to reach out to any one of us and you can certainly learn more about the project. But the thing I really think that all the entrepreneurs on here ought to invest in for themselves and their teams is the LTD, the leadership and team development. Like any business owner that has three or more employees who's watching or listening to this, if you don't invest in having Steve and Ray come out and work with you and your team, your organization, to help them build better teamwork, problem solving, communication, and leadership skills, you are missing out on massive amounts of money. Where would they go to contact you guys for that? We, they can go to the, LT, the ltdtraining.com is the uh, official website, or they could contact either of us on Instagram. That's usually the best way on the Instagram. And you're, what's your Instagram? Steve Eckert, Steve Eckert one And I'm at Ray Cash Care. Done deal. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on The Empire Show. And if you like this episode of The Empire Show, please do me a favor, take a screenshot, make sure you tag myself, Ray, and Steve. And of course, leave us a five-star review. Give us a thumbs up on all the different platforms. And thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you later.